みなさん、はじめまして。DNX チームの Q です。よろしくお願いします。Uh, today we are here to talk about a very special topic and joining me for that topic is Stephen Latrofsan, all the way from London, born, raised and flying from London. Uh, so thank you very much for making the long trip. We're going to be talking about a very important、uh, subject,、uh, specifically sustainability, ESG, and how ISI, our portfolio company, has played a very critical role. But before I、uh, go to more details about ISI, I want to talk briefly about what DNX has been doing in,、uh, in climate tech. We are not just entering this today, we've been doing this. For the last decade. And I want to just go through about the few lessons that we have learned and the two、uh, phases of investments,、uh, a series of investments that we have done over the last decade. So I'll talk briefly about,、uh, about some of those things. In the first phase, we started around 2011 and we made、uh, investments in solar generation, solar efficiency. In,、uh, in biomaterials and also building energy efficiency. And we learned some tough lessons、uh, on that one that I'll describe on the next slide. And then we,、uh, we essentially pivoted. And the main pivot was the learning that it has to be vertical SaaS oriented so that you can go and control 60, 70, 80% margin businesses and build these businesses all the way to IPO. So、uh, you know, we pivoted and We saw that some of our portfolio companies、uh, in that have become market leaders. Companies like ISI, that we're going to talk about today. We also have a portfolio company called Zoom, which is doing the electrification of school transportation. Talk about that in a moment. And then you've already heard from Zero Board, a portfolio company from Japan. Let me talk about what the takeaways were. From our first phase of investing. It's a good way of saying we learn a lot of lessons by losing money. But、uh, let me summarize a few of those lessons. On our investments in solar、uh, generation efficiency and uh, uh, solar materials, what we learned very quickly is that going head on on a technology that is getting commoditized very quickly, especially in this case from China. Uh, was a huge learning lesson. We had Cubotics, which was building robots that w a s doing dual axis、uh, movement of the solar panels so as to increase efficiency by 25%. But the cost down of solar was happening at a much faster rate. And as a result,、uh, the ROI and the amount of time to get the capex back kept on increasing. Same way in the case of SIGs. Uh, Vitriflex was providing some materials for SIGs, which was flexible solar. It was the same problem. Then we learned in biomaterials is not to really back things which make sense at a certain oil barrel price. So, for example,、uh, Glycos was doing a technology which was making isoprene instead from oil, it was making it from biofeedstock. That made a lot of economic sense at $100 a barrel. But when oil crashed in 2015, 2016 at $50 a barrel, that was not competitive anymore. So we learned another important lesson about not betting on the price of oil when you're making investments. And the last one was Enlighted, which was in the energy efficiency space in the buildings, where they would deploy sensors in, in the buildings. And based on the motion and the occupancy of the building, they would reduce. Uh, electric, electricity consumption by about 70%. The problem there was the capex that was required to install these sensors in the building. And at that time, in 2011, there were not any PPA or capex financing products. So we were a little bit ahead of the curve. So, fast forward, we learned a lot of lessons, as I mentioned. But the most important lesson was how do we essentially apply? Uh, vertical SaaS business models focus on workflow integration in that vertical and essentially make both a、uh, climate tech and also make financial returns for the fund. So I'll take a few minutes and talk a little bit about 
our investment uh, from the lessons that we learned on vertical SaaS and workflow automation with a company called Zoom. This was a company originally when they launched, uh, it was launched in, in the basement of DNX uh, in Hero City. And originally they were a B2C company. The idea being a Uber for school kids. And so the, uh, the business model was first directly targeting the parents of school children so they can send their uh, children in, in school buses. Well, they very quickly learned that the B2C model uh, is a very tough one for school children. So they pivoted that to providing a full digitization and transpar transparency model for school districts. And here the idea was the customer is no longer the parent. The customer is the school district. And what the school district gets is a dashboard where they can see exactly who's picking up which child, where the child is in transit, and if instead of a 40 person bus, if you require a 10 person bus, they can use a better smaller bus to save fuel. And on the side of the parents, they're able to see exactly where their child is. So, and from a child's perspective, they know exactly which driver is picking up. So that whole hundred year model of old yellow school buses in the US where nobody knows where their children are, the school cannot answer the call and say, uh, to the parents where they are, or if a driver cancels, you don't know what to do. They changed that entire model by bringing digitization and transparency to it. But here's the thing, they didn't start the company based on electrification of the school bus. They started the company on digitization, workflow, vertical SaaS. And then once they got a few schools signed up, they turned the model on its head and said, let's now also electrify the school buses. So now the diesel school buses, uh, essentially by 2025, the company plans to have 100% electric school buses. So this is a great example of maybe not starting off with sustainability, forming a beachhead market, and then going on uh, full on for sustainability. I didn't, uh, I skipped some of those things where the investor base and, uh, and also some of the uh, milestones that the company has done. They have multi hundred million dollar contracts uh, with school districts like the San Francisco United, Oakland United School District, and recently raised a huge round from SoftBank Vision Fund. The new climate tech landscape looks like this. What we've got is the millennial uh, generation is not only coming up, there's about 135 million millennials in the US and there's about 70 million plus Gen Zs that are coming up. These are no longer just customers, but they are gonna be also decision makers inside corporations. They're gonna be buyers of technology. The second thing that's happening is large government focus. Government uh, across across the world are realizing climate change is happening at a much faster pace. They're putting on infrastructure funds, climate tech funds for the transition, uh, let's say for example, from diesel buses to actually electric buses. Third, uh, actually I talked with several of you today during the breaks and what's becoming clearer is if large companies like yourselves don't innovate, you are gonna lose your customers and this is gonna happen this is happening even with larger brands, whether it's clothing brands, um, consumer electronics brands, if they don't show a roadmap for sustainability, the customers are leaving them. A very important piece that happened in the last three to four years is that whether it's hurricanes or, or flooding, uh, earthquakes, a third of the US population has now experienced catastrophes firsthand. And this has really changed the mindset like it had not done in 2011. So this is an important factor. And so the last piece of all this stuff is the financial investors and financial institutions have started to push their portfolio companies to, to essentially adopt sustainability. So these five factors are causing a huge shift in the climate tech landscape. I wanna give a little spotlight and then hand it over to Steven in a second. Uh, I wanna talk a little bit about 
this, this particular picture shows Rafal, who is the CEO of uh, ISI. He came to our offices at DNX in 2017 in, uh, in Silicon Valley. And this was the first sensor that you can see, the radar sensor, it was pretty bulky. <laughs> and the, the, I was just struck by how young the team was, but not only the team was that of satellite and rocket scientists, but also really good business uh, people. They had their first contract before they could even put a satellite up. And they did that by putting the sensor on a plane and just flying and, and getting some results. In 2018, after we made the investment in, in 2017, and, and a big shout out to our uh, LP IHI who helped me in the due diligence of this portfolio company, the technology due diligence. We, uh, we came in 2018 and we visited several of DNX corporate LPs. And amongst them was one very big innovator, uh, our LP Tokyo Marine. We had the first meeting to discuss how ISI can bring this technology, not just for defense and government, those are important things, but how it could be applied for catastrophe. And it has now been three years since that first meeting. And last year, uh, we announced some really good collaboration and products where ISI can help the monitoring of catastrophes, particularly flood monitoring that Stephen is gonna talk about in a minute. So I hope uh, uh, at the, today Stephen is visiting us and I hope to have the same trip uh, this week and next week and visit some of our LPs in construction, in, in a retail and a variety of different spaces to see three years from now, we'll be back on stage and announcing some new products. So the path forward out here is, uh, Ikigai is a, is a you know, very important concept in Japan, but it's also now being recognized all over the world in essentially combining both, you know, for DNX, both doing good for the planet, but also making really good financial investments. With that, I'd like to give the presentation to Stephen, who is gonna talk a little bit more about ISI. Thanks so much. Hajime Mashite, uh, Watashi wa Steve Des, and I'll have to complete my personal introduction in English, I'm afraid. It's an absolute pleasure. So many thanks to you, Q, for this opportunity to introduce ISI uh, to your B2B summit today. It's a real pleasure and a privilege. Um, those that have been observantly watching the videos between the speaking sessions today will have noticed that ISI is at its core a space technology company. You couldn't miss those images of rockets taking off uh, and satellites buzzing around the planet. Um, I'd like to get a little bit more deep into uh, what ISI does, how it relates to that climate change theme uh, that Q has introduced and what better place to be doing that than here in Japan, in Tokyo, uh, the city in which Q and my CEO, uh, Rafael, spent time with Tokyo Marine back there in uh, 2018 with a box of technology that looks very different today. So um, ISI uh, is a company that has its headquarters in Finland, uh, in the Helsinki area, but has an increasingly international team uh, operations and customer base. And we are a world leader in some very important core technology within ISI, which is the miniaturization of synthetic aperture radar, SAR or SAR, as you'll hear me refer to it a few times today. And that box of technology that Q showed you was an early version of our synthetic aperture radar uh, technology. What ISI has been able to do that's been so powerful is couple the miniaturization of that technology with miniaturized satellites, bring all of that capability to bear to be able to achieve significantly more complete, accurate, and timely observation and measurement of what is happening on the Earth's surface. We couple that capability with really deep data analytics, multi-source data analytics, in order to provide insights to our customers and solutions to our customers. We've been able to do that and to build this company and this core technology and solutions focus rapidly because we have 
an absolutely world-class set of investors behind us. Obviously, front and centre uh, within our investors, DNX Ventures. Um, Q plays a really active role on our board as well as an, as an investor, helping the team to come up with a strategy uh, to win and then helping us uh, to deliver that strategy. So we are hugely grateful uh, for that support. We also enjoy um, the support of an increasing, increasingly global and prestigious customer base. You'll see on this slide a number of organisations that you'll recognise as government agencies, also organisations that are leaders in the insurance industry in particular. And those two sectors, if you like, um, are really interested in ISI for reasons that I hope will become really clear as I carry on in this presentation and our fireside chat. I've really got to call out, Q's already mentioned, Tokyo Marine as an investor, um, as a customer, and as a genuine innovation partner. Tokyo Marine's vision and mission is to be a good company. Uh, and here in Japan, working um, with our colleague, friend and innovation partner, Masaki-san, um, we're working on how to apply the technology that we'll describe today to really just deliver a more complete uh, level of support to customers that are impacted by you know, serious um, flooding events. So that's a, that's a partnership that is beyond a, a customer a relationship and one that we're very proud of. So let's dig into the technology then. We are all used to seeing beautiful photographic images of Earth. Uh, we're all used to spinning around the planet on Google Earth, zooming in and seeing beautiful pictures of what's on the ground. What we are looking at is a historical snapshot of what the planet has looked like at a point in time. We're also used to seeing major weather events from space, swirling clouds, depending on where you are, hurricanes, typhoons, and the like. And that photographic imagery, beautiful as it is, has some real shortcomings, though, if you are trying to actually make decisions about what is happening on the ground while it's happening or immediately after it's happened. Uh, and for catastrophe events, uh, the biggest limitation is actually seeing the planet at a point in time. The synthetic aperture radar technology that I described to you has a fantastic benefit, which is it doesn't see daylight or nighttime. It can see through clouds. It can see through dust. Uh, and as a result, it is much more powerful than optical imagery in seeing what's happening when a major flood or other event happens. And we've taken that capability and we've wrapped it up with data in order to prepare and produce and deliver to our customers actionable insights. Because the, the technology is so great to look at, I've got to show you a picture of one of the satellites, right? So this, one of the big differences here in iSize technology is SAR has been around for a few years, but insurance companies and government agencies would have to order individual images from multi-use satellite providers. Those satellites were enormously expensive, you know, quarter of a million dollars, half a million dollars, uh, to build. Um, they were huge and are huge. Uh, think about the size of a four bedroomed house. So that miniaturization world in I size uh, word in I size world is all about shrinking everything down. And with achieving a hundred kilogram satellite um, that has all the capability and more of those traditional satellites, we've been able to fundamentally reduce by orders of magnitude the cost of building and of launching the technology. And that in turn, the change in economics there has enabled ISI to establish the largest constellation of SAR satellites that is buzzing around this planet today. And we have a significant head start in any other providers or providers of SAR imagery, um, because frankly, we got there quicker with innovation and, and the innovation is built in uh, to ISI. We design and build not just the satellites, but all of the components within the satellites ourselves. We control the satellites ourselves and direct them ourselves. So there's a huge amount of ownership of that innovation uh, and pace in that innovation, which is absolutely unique. It's not just about the number of satellites, the importance of that I will come back to, but it's also the technical 
an observational capability of those satellites that's unique. Um, our satellites are capable of extensive coverage because we have so many, but they are also capable of zooming out and taking an individual image that is 10,000 kilometers square, which is perfect if you're trying to find a lost ship in an ocean where there's been a question of piracy or looking for an oil spill or something similar. It's also good for wide angle flood detection. Uh, with our latest generation of technology, we can then zoom in as well into a spot and look at a 15 kilometer by 15 kilometer area with individual pixels that are one meter by one meter and get to millimeter level of accuracy in particular use cases, which is again, unprecedented in this technology. So let me give you a few, just on one slide, a few practical examples of what we do with all of that cleverness. Um, there are five examples squeezed into one slide, so I apologize. Up there at the top left um, is an introductory image to our flood uh, analysis. I'll talk to you more about that in just a second. On the right there, you see a time sequence, which you can achieve if you have multiple satellites passing the same spot on Earth multiple times uh, a day. Um, what we've got there is uh, an eruption of a volcano in Iceland. Um, bottom left, a more commercial application. Those are ships coming in and out of the port of Rotterdam. Uh, and that is um, onshore um, oil containers being filled up and emptied as um, the oil comes in and out of the port. In the middle at the bottom there, we have another uh, catastrophe analysis. That's a wildfire. Uh, analysis in California. I'll drill into that for you a little bit further in a second. And then bottom right, related directly to climate change, one of ISI's original use cases, <clears throat> the, uh, the clue is in the name, was in observing ice and the movement of ice and the extension or retraction of ice um, area. So you see there, that's movement, if you can just about make it out, um, of a glacier uh, in Alaska over a, a series of days. So let me then just drill into catastrophe. So in, in, in you know, keeping with Q's introduction around uh, the climate, you know, we are all too aware in Japan, if anything more so than anywhere else on the planet, of the increasing frequency and severity of um, natural catastrophe. It comes in many flavors, all of them devastating. Um, you know, flood for us is one that, as Q said, we've been working on uh, for a few years. We have a very mature product, and I'll describe that to you because it's an indication of where we take the observation into solution, into insights and into solutions. We're working very actively here in Japan on wind, uh, earthquake, wildfire. We'll be looking at tsunami uh, this year, and we also expect to be doing some volcano monitoring. We've done it in other countries. We expect to do it here in Japan. But let me start with flood, because flood is uh, a peril that represents uh, for the planet $100 million worth of cost uh, every year on average. And it's hugely devastating for individuals, for families, for businesses, for communities uh, when it strikes, um, obviously. And if you are an insurance company or a service provider, or a government agency that is trying to help uh, individuals and businesses, then what you really need is to know when an event is likely to occur and to then have a really complete and accurate view as rapidly as possible of how that event is developing and whom and where it is having an effect on the people that you care about. So EyeSight has gone way beyond just pointing our satellites at Earth and collecting catching, um, capturing pictures uh, of, of flooding. Um, we have meteorologists on our team at iSight. They are continually watching the weather. We've built an application that combines weather forecasting with uh, models of historical flooding. And our guys sit there every day and have what they call floodles, flood huddles, uh, at which they decide where they think there may be a weather event that is of concern. We then task the satellites, because we control our satellites, to capture as much imagery in the areas of interest as we can, as early as we can, and throughout the event. The team brings that together uh, with other important data sources, hydrological models, digital terrain models, flood gauges, 
um, photographic images from drones, photographic images from social media that we can apply a latitude and longitude to. And then we apply artificial intelligence, machine learning, and a lot of um, high speed and high depth analysis to come out with what we consider to be the best insight into flooding available on this planet. It looks beautiful as well, in my view. So the shades of blue here um, are different depths of water. Uh, this is the Hitoyoshi uh, flooding last year in Japan. Uh, what you're seeing is, uh, you know, obviously originally a river with inundation outside of the banks of that river. The, the darker the blue, the deeper the water. And what we've done here is combine property information, those blocks are buildings, with the depth of water uh, in order to be able to assess or estimate the depth of the water as it has affected each of those buildings. So red, most severe, amber, less severe, yellow, less severe, and then no color at all hasn't been affected. So that, that analysis, just to take a business perspective for ISI, has huge value across different areas, just one industry, insurance, of the insurance value chain. So we here in Japan, as I've mentioned, are working very actively to see what benefit can be brought to individuals and businesses in Japan when a flood event happens and there is support required and claims uh, to be managed. Um, elsewhere around the world, we are um, supporting entirely new insurance products that are parametric, where a payment to a customer is based on our measurement rather than underwriting an assessment of loss. Uh, we are working with risk managers to understand what our experience of flooding might mean uh, for underwriting uh, new risks. Uh, and we're helping people to estimate financial cost so that they can manage what are called reserves uh, more accurately. So a whole host of use cases, I'm just conscious of time. Um, so I'll, I'll just quickly say, as well as providing that insight, we also um, are looking to make this stuff as accessible to our customers as possible. So we here are looking at another event, slightly different presentational format because that is presented through one of our partners software product. We've chosen to work with this partner because they have the capability to apply an algorithm that says the deeper the water, the more damage is likely, apply a probability. And that enables insurance companies using this tool to, to not just understand which of their customers have been affected, but also to put an estimate on the likely cost of damage and the likely aggregate cost of a particular event to them as a business. Briefly, wildfire, another example of where SAR imagery can do great things. Here, we have a, a Dixie fire in California. We have our SAR imagery showing the impact on um, uh, woodland and also on buildings. This is a similar coding of which buildings were destroyed or severely damaged. And this is interesting. This is FEMA's assessment, the Federal Emergency Management Agency's assessment of damage. And you can see if we zoomed in in the same uh, degree, there's a really high match between what we observed. The difference is we expect to have this stuff available 24 hours after the fire has passed. The FEMA analysis typically takes a number of weeks and sometimes months. Um, so you can see that that real-time nature is, is unique. Getting to climate change, um, this technology, we have the ability to do all sorts of different observation of things that you know, man may be doing to the planet that may have an impact and accelerate climate change if not dealt with. So for instance, we can measure and are currently in Brazil measuring and observing illegal deforestation and logging. On the flip side, we can look from an ESG perspective at where new forestry is being planted and growing and becoming more dense and maturing. There are plenty of uh, ESG um, and climate protecting applications uh, for SAR. Let me roll all of this back up and just talk a bit about how this supports an ISI business strategy. As I've described, at the core of what we do is world-class, world-leading technology for miniaturized SAR and miniaturized satellites. We'll continue to build that constellation. We will be adding another few satellites. We'll be at 20 soon, including some very soon, uh, i.e. this week, that will be launched and go into orbit. 
We have illustrated, I hope today, that we are beyond just imagery, we are into solutions. So we have our flood solutions, we will be delivering additional solutions to insurance shortly. We're opening up that insight and data to be consumed by other applications. Our partners um, are currently using our data without ISI being directly involved in providing solutions to their customers. And we continue to invest uh, in the new technology. But I just wanted to highlight just how the pace of innovation supported by our investors is cracking on. So, you know, this, this image here is quite exciting. Um, that's not a satellite. That is a high altitude pseudo satellite. It's a high altitude um, unmanned aircraft that is conceptually here, designed to fly around an area of interest. It will be powered by solar power during the day. And at night, it will be powered by its batteries. It will fly above the clouds. It will fly above civilian uh, aircraft. Um, and it will enable us to capture images closer to Earth and also to get them down to Earth more rapidly uh, than we can from space. So that's very powerful. And that's an artist's impression. And that looks like something that is envisioned today that might happen in a decade or two. But this is what it looks like uh, in uh, eyesight pace. So that's been developed now by a team uh, based in our development center in Spain. That's a prototype uh, that we're testing now. We haven't announced this publicly anywhere other than today. So I, I'm very proud to be announcing that here in you know, a, a, a city that has so much innovation. It's a great place for us to be describing this to you. And I just wanted to share that because that shows the pace at which we're moving. And I think, you, I've used up more than the extra minutes you granted me, so my apologies, but thank you for the opportunity to say a few words about ISI. Thank you, Stephen. First of all, a uh, huge clap for first announcing HAPS. <laughs> uh, this, uh, that, the, the HAPS project that he just showed back, uh, this was a skunk work, so sometimes it's called under the radar. Even the board of ISI didn't know that this was being developed. And uh, announcing this for the first time publicly at the B2B summit in Tokyo shows how important uh, Japan plays a role for ISI. So thank you very much. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you. Stephen, I know we've got limited time uh, on the questions. I was gonna ask you a lot about uh, you know, your, your family and yourself, but <laughs> I'll skip a little bit of that in sure, the interest sure. of time sure. and see. Uh, you worked quite a bit in the insurance industry, probably for 20, 30 years uh, through different consulting, mm -hmm. Accenture, et cetera. Uh, can you speak to a little bit about why ISI, uh, you know, excites you? Sure. Uh, especially with the- Sure, that, that uh, I could use up the remaining minutes on that. So, I mean, so as you say, Q, my, my early career, I spent 20 years, um, I trained as a mechanical engineer got sucked into IT consultancy. I was a very bad software engineer for just a few months, right? Um, got into consultancy because that meant I didn't have to do any software engineering. Uh, spent 20 years at Accenture. I was a partner in the financial services practice. I spent the last 10 years working for private equity sponsored software businesses. The CEO of one that we um, we exited to a strategic uh, buyer in February last year. So all of that was great fun. Technology enabled innovation, but this is by any measure the most exciting job I've ever had because we are not, we are not sort of making small adjustments to the way that businesses or governments manage their processes. What we are doing here is providing a completely unique technology that will have, you know, Life and world changing impact is my absolute passion. Um, and, you know, it, it, it is transformational in every sense of the word. So just being part of that in, you know, starting with insurance, an industry I love, um, it, it, it's just, it just the pen, potential blows me away. Uh, and, you know, I, I'm, I'm a, I've got three grown up kids. Um, they are in that, in that bracket that you said would be the decision makers of the future. May we all be spared from my kids making decisions uh, for the planet. But they, they feel passionate about this. And I, I'm proud to be describing what ISI is doing, Q. So it's just really motivating. And, and, and maybe put that in the context of Japan. 
you know. Sure. I mean, look, this this beautiful country is, uh, you know, more susceptible than most to natural catastrophe. I mean, I, I am the least well qualified in this room uh, to make that statement. I mean, it, 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 it is it is a, a business community that has that focus on doing good. I think my experience, and it's been a real privilege to work so closely with Tokyo Marine, is that that is absolutely driving the adoption of this technology for their customers and their business partners in this market. And I think, you know, all of the perils that I described that we can work with here have the potential to be really important to this country, um, as they do in other countries and continents. But I think the reason I'm so excited about the guy before I joined ISI, Tokyo Marine being an investor and a customer, is that coincidence between us having clever technology, there being a planet level important set of perils to deal with, and having a truly innovative environment, Japan, customer, Tokyo Marine, investor, Tokyo Marine. And, and you know, we, we look forward to working on the other perils together. It's, it, this is a great place to be doing this work. Thank you. Uh, while you send the questions, you know, one question that comes up quite a bit uh, is you're flying so high up and, you know, you talk about a meter or 10 meter by 10 meter, but then in the same breath, you talk about millimeter accuracy. Can you expand a little bit on sure. how you can get there to yes. a millimeter accuracy? Sure, sure. So um, we describe our technology as being multimodal. So we can't achieve millimeter level measurement across you know, a really wide area in one shot. And in the past, SAR technology has been somewhere in the middle. You know, you could capture a big area with a reasonable degree of accuracy. What we've been developing in the latest generation of the satellites is that ability to zoom out that I described. So as an event, um, thinking about a, a flood, as an event is apparent, then zooming out and starting to capture the extent of the, the flood, um, it, we can do really, really well. When, when we need to monitor an individual asset or thing on the ground, the fact that we are able to zoom in with our satellites as well and over a, over a course of the satellite passing over a point, take multiple images of that point means that we can see it from a number of different places. Mm. Use those multiple, say 12 images of a single spot from one pass of the satellite, bring them all together. The human brain can't do this, right? But the AI can mm -hmm. process all of that. And that's how you get down to millimeter level accuracy. And it, you know, what's special about our constellation as we're adding new satellites is the ability to kind of do both, to zoom out, get a fix on something and then for other use cases zoom right in so it, it, it is it, it's astonishingly accurate um and hugely powerful but you know again from a business perspective it is powered by having sufficient coverage in the constellation and then each satellite being equipped to to do that into the future it's just it's just great i i know you have some wonderful videos if, if there is yeah, a yeah. If, if we're able to call up the uh, the if, if you will bear with me for another slide or two so this is my point here you know we don't take one image as the satellite passes as the satellite goes over a spot while we are in spot mode we pick up multiple images we stack those up and then we have the choice of analyzing to get very, very accurate analysis or seeing a little time series. So that's where we can track movement mm. of an asset over time. If you can zoom back out for me, guys, back up to the menu page. So click there for me. Um, just to show what this is capable of when monitoring an asset. Let's look at subsidence here. Sorry, to the left. Perfect. So this is a, this is a, um, a time series again but where we're showing in red, where the, the level of the earth has subsided by, as we measure it over time, uh, 40 millimeters a year. So this is the result of groundwater extraction um, in an area in California. So 40 millimeters at one level over a year doesn't sound much, but if you've got a building that is in this red area, you can be pretty sure that that's gonna be starting to move mm. uh, as that um, extraction continues. So somebody might want to take some action there. 
Uh, and then building movement, let me just show you another asset being monitored. Uh, so this is Barcelona, uh, two tower blocks in Barcelona. And what we are monitoring here using that technology that I described, in blue, there isn't very much or any movement um, of what we're observing uh, with our satellite passes. At the top of this building here, you're seeing 13 millimeters of thermal expansion movement of that building. So look, we are in, if we could click back, we're in the early stages queue really of this. Mm -hmm. We know that we have the capability to do that kind of persistent monitoring. We're continuing to develop our flood offering and our other perils for, for natural catastrophe. But from my perspective for insurance and other industries, that ability to monitor change at high levels of accuracy with persistent passes of the satellite has a whole range of applications for construction, mm -hmm. um, you know, for um, heavy engineering. Uh, and we've, we've, we're part way through really developing a set of use cases and engaging with customers to help us with our R&D program, Q. Those videos and, and, and the pictures you showed were just phenomenal in terms of describing. Uh, We've got a couple of minutes left. Sure. And I want to ask you about HAPS. Sure. What excites you? You're the head of solutions and you're going to be, you know, bringing all of these uh, different things to catastrophes. But what about HAPS excites you? What is going to be able to do for these? Sure. I mean, the reason HAPS is so exciting, I mean, the, the clue is in the name. So high altitude pseudo satellite so what we didn't call this was like a, a drone on steroids or something right. because this is this is again about persistent monitoring of an area achieving the same kind of thing that we do with our satellites which is being able to predictably pass over points on earth but to bring that focus down to an area on earth and to really focus the same SAR technology but that much closer to the target mm -hmm. So that means that we will increase even further the accuracy and persistency and frequency of our observation. But the other thing that you don't realize unless you work with the satellites is because they're in space, one of the limiting factors for us is getting the data down mm. from the satellite into our analytics process. Because you know, as quick as you look up, those satellites are buzzing around the planet you know, in an hour and a half. So they do not hang around. They are fast, right? right? And, and it takes time to get the signal down, and bring the mm. data down. That is less of a problem when it's a circling pseudo satellite over an area. So for us, this technology means that we are filling in a really important area of data capture from seeing very wide angle with accuracy from space, and you know, remote from individual sensors on the ground hmm. or drones that have to be flown on demand or aircraft that have to be flown on demand to persistently monitoring a city or a rainforest or a, a glacier or whatever it is we want to monitor. So the technology will, get, will bring us from satellites to pseudo satellites that will just even broaden the capability that we have to offer to our customers. So it's super exciting. Well, that was a fascinating um, uh, discussion and a fireside chat with you, Stephen. Thank you so much for doing this. Please give it up for Steve. Thank you. Thank you.